In May 2015, BDO kicked off the Workplace Giving Program with its first recipient being the QUT Learning Potential Fund. I think the Learning Potential Fund is, is fabulous in the way that QUT supports it. Um, so all the money that goes to that fund is going to the students that need it because I'm a big believer in that power of education um, and that everybody should have the opportunity to go to university. Learning Potential Fund is pretty unique in what it offers to the students and we saw some of the students' stories and I think that all resonated with us. My name is Jordan Lee. I graduated from my bachelor's degree in 2019 and from my uh, graduate diploma and legal practice in July of this year uh, and I'm soon to be admitted as a solicitor in the Supreme Court of Queensland. I decided to study law and become a lawyer to help those in a place of need access the justice that they deserve. To organisations looking to make an impact on the community, I couldn't recommend QUT's Learning Potential Fund more as a fantastic way to invest in the potential of students who wouldn't otherwise be able to reach out and achieve their goals and their ambitions. Our thanks to the sponsors of the QUT Business Leaders Forum. Primary sponsors, BDO, Brisbane Airport, SAP. Major sponsors, Aon. Brand Audits, Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand, Gaydens. Hilton Hotel Brisbane, Sun Super, The Courier Mail, Supporters, Cloverly Estate, Console, Newstead Brewing Co, Stranger Films. On behalf of the QT Business School, I'd like to welcome you to the second virtual QT Business Leaders Forum for 2020. We're delighted to be able to continue the QUT Business Leaders Forum for this year, albeit in a different mode. I acknowledge the Turbul and Yuggera people as the First Nations owners of the lands where QUT now stands and from where we're hosting today's presentation. I pay respect to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits and recognise that these lands have always been places of teaching, research and learning. I acknowledge the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play within the QUT community. Today, we have people joining us online from across Australia and overseas. Working online has helped us to diversify our audience, which is fantastic. And for our first time attendees, I hope you truly enjoy the experience. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge our 2020 sponsors and supporters. Thank you for your ongoing support for the QUT Business Leaders Forum. 
Your sponsorship and patronage enable us to continue to host these conversations where world-class leaders can share their experiences and learnings, particularly in the current times. COVID-19 continues to impact our lives in many and varied ways, and we're all learning to live with the uncertainty that it brings. Within the QUT community of students and staff, it's heartwarming to see the innovation and resilience on show every day as we come together to work on the present and the future. I recently joined an international panel addressing the resilience of business schools and how to best prepare them for the future. I framed my contribution around bouncing forward, not back, as I do believe new ways of learning and working are on our doorstep if we have the courage to think and act differently. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that proactive posture in today's conversation. Today, we're delighted to welcome Susan Anderson to the QUT Business Leaders Forum. Susan has led Uber across Australia and New Zealand for the last two years and has now expanded her role to include North Asia. Susan will draw from her leadership experience, not just at Uber, but also at Amazon and Bain & Co in today's presentation. And I'm sure this will very much reflect the passion and openness that Susan brings to her role. Thank you, Susan, for joining us and for working with our team to make today work. Welcome also to Kerry O'Brien as our moderator. We look forward to the conversation that Kerry will lead with Susan. Throughout Susan's conversation with Kerry, there'll be time for you to submit your own questions using the Q&A function on your screen. Kerry will try to have as many questions answered as possible, time permitting. Our series is all about leadership, and we've been blessed within the QT Business Leaders Forum to work with a team leader who never met a problem she couldn't work through and had one of the most can-do attitudes I've ever come across. Today, I'd like to acknowledge the hard work and dedication of that leader, Genevieve Deaconos, who has recently taken on a new challenge outside QUT. I'm sure our long-term attendees and sponsors and supporters will join me in wishing Jen all the best for her future endeavours. And I'd like to acknowledge the hard work of all of the QUT Business Leaders Forum team under the guidance of Associate Professor Amanda Goodmanson as Executive Dean who have truly worked as a team to ensure that we could successfully deliver the forum in 2020. We couldn't have made events such as today work without your dedication. So thank you once again for a great year. Ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy today's QT Business Leaders Forum webcast with Susan Anderson and Kerry O'Brien. Thank you again for your support of the QT Business Leaders Forum in our 23rd year and we look forward to welcoming you early next year to our 2021 series. Thank you, Rabina, and can I also add my welcome to this virtual QUT Business Leaders Forum event, and also my acknowledgement of the Bungjiang people, whose country I am on today, and pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. This is our second such event since the pandemic, this pandemic has changed our lives in so many ways, so many fundamental ways. And needless to say, it's at times like these that we look to our leaders to step up, not just in politics, but across the spectrum of community. And we've had ample opportunity in the past six months uh, to see and learn from leadership at its best and sadly at its worst and all shades in between. In Australia, we've seen leadership at times verge on the inspirational, certainly among our frontline health professionals. And even when we've seen our political leaders stumble, or allow themselves to fall back in old political polarizations, they can still hold their heads high uh, compared to some of the worst we've seen abroad, particularly in Donald Trump's America. Americans cast their judgment on President Trump in just seven weeks, and I don't believe it's overstating things to identify the coming election as perhaps the most pivotal presidential election in the post-war era, not just for America, but the rest of the world and certainly for those who are invested in Western-style liberal democracy. Australia's primary uh, preoccupation beyond suppressing the virus itself is, of course, how quickly we can reopen our deeply bruised economy, where some industries have never had it so good, while others, many others, are suffering badly, even to the point of collapse. It's been strange indeed to watch the markets reflect that fractured economy. Uh, even as we've crashed into recession, the share market has been sustained by largely booming tech stocks and online retailers or even the Harvey Normans who think that every day is Boxing Day. 
just another reminder of the brave new world we're now in, a world of disruptors like Google and Amazon and Facebook and Tesla, disruptors like Uber. By her own admission, Susan Anderson is a woman who likes scary ideas, and since the digital age is awash in scary ideas, this is definitely her time. Uh, although in the case of Uber, most of the fear seems to be without rather than within. Uh, being felt more by the traditional players in transport and service sectors uh, which have been turned upside down by the Uber world. Uh, what are the leadership qualities that have taken Susan Anderson, Anderson to the top, heading Uber in Australia, New Zealand and Northern Asia, uh, in what is still very much a male world? Before we start our conversation, uh, just a reminder that while we're talking to you, you can post uh, any question for Susan. Uh, in the Q&A box on your screen, and I'll weave as many as I can into the flow of our conversation. Susan Anderson, welcome to the QUT Business Leaders Forum. Thank you so much, Kerry. It's great to be here today. So let's start with scary ideas. I know you cut your management teeth with Amazon, uh, the biggest disruptor of them all in the eyes of many, but how scary was it four years ago jumping on board with Uber? I actually, I arrived in Australia following my husband's job. Um, he was working on the Commonwealth Games down on the Gold Coast. Um, and actually the scariest move I had to make was to leave my job in Amazon in the UK where I was having a great experience running Prime Now, which is one hour retail service, um, to actually move across the world, not knowing what I would do, um, unsure kind of what the opportunities would look like for me in Queensland um, and to take that move. but. You know, when looked at it as a whole for our family, um, you know, some of the fear goes away and you have to have confidence that you can kind of move forward at that point. Um, and I just happened to, I had lived in Australia previously and knew somebody who was working on Uber um, and they were looking for someone to help launch Uber Eats um, across Australia and starting running the Queensland business. Uh, to me, I, I had some experience of this within Amazon, so some of it felt very familiar, but kind of joining this company that was um, very new, uh, very kind of in the public eye, um, with this fantastically smart and passionate team. Um, you know, you come on board with this pressure to kind of build something new, build something big, um, and no playbook to do it. And so I think it was one of the best parts of actually joining Uber at that time, which was nobody's nobody's got this path, nobody knows how to do this. It's actually just around test, learn, pivot, um, always be a truth seeker, kind of, and by that I mean, look for actually what is working versus not, um, and be okay if things don't go as you, as you thought they would. Um, it takes a little bit of resilience, but um, provided you have good fun people around, um, I think it's always, always a good, good move to make. So what, uh, what, what in real terms uh, w were the skills that you had learnt or developed uh, through Amazon that were applicable to Uber? I think I always try to start with simplifying complex problems. Um, when you're launching a new business like Uber Eats, there is many things that you could focus your time on. Um, you could focus time on thinking about how you expand to even new innovations beyond that. Um, um, and one of the challenges with working in a startup or, or a company like Uber that has a lot of opportunities is knowing what, you, what you're going to do, but more importantly, what you are not going to do. And so I think that was the key thing I learned at Amazon, which was focus in on just the key things that are going to matter and that are going to matter to the customer. And so at those early days for Uber Eats, I tried to keep the team extremely focused on three things. That was selection. Can customers get what they want um, in the houses that they're in? And it's actually very local. It's kind of what your experience looks like in the center of Brisbane is very different to what that might look like um, in some of the outer suburbs. So selection number one. Second, just ongoing expansion. The more customers you can get to, the bigger you can grow the business. So rather than trying to optimize where we are at one stage, like beginning to kind of grow at the same time. And then the third is reliability. If people cannot get, if they've ordered food and they have children waiting for it at home or they're hungry, um, you've got to make sure you're reliable. Uh, we actually created in the early days what we called the Hangry um, Index, which was kind of ranking uh, the worst performing cities and trying to kind of have a bit of a competition about who might be um, um, not delivering kind of the right customer experience and really trying to get people to think about that. Um, 
and it meant there was a lot of things we didn't do. We had kind of people come to us looking for sponsorships or get involved in this marketing activity or do these at, at this opportunity and actually just staying focused on the key things that are actually going to move the needle um, is the most important piece in my, in my mind. So the scary bit in all that, as I understand it, was the goals you set. <coughs> And, and, and I suppose in, in telling us exactly what the, why the goal was scary, yeah. uh, I imagine to you as well as your team, but, I, uh, or I put it the other way around, as well as, to the team as well as you. Yeah. Um, it, is it a part of your modus operandi that you actually go looking for the scary ideas to embrace? It, it really is. Um, I like setting what I call a, a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, what I, I remember talking to my team about wanting to expand beyond Queensland and um, there were seven locations we wanted to go to kind of beyond the cities we we're in. Um, the kind of next tier of cities including kind of Canberra, um, you kind of uh, d Sunshine Coast, um, cities of that nature. And I set the team the goal which was we're going to expand to this next seven locations and we're going to do it in a seven week time period. Um, and they looked at me like I was insane and uh, you know saying like I don't think that's possible and you know, what I like to say is, you know, actually it's, you know, it, it's fine. If we do it in nine weeks, that will be a good result. Um, but if we set ourselves the ambition to do that in six months, we will take six months to do it. If we set ourselves the ambition to do it in seven weeks, even if we don't quite get it, we're going to have done it substantially faster. Um, and then what that means is you really focus in on the key things that you do. You can move fast. Be okay with things not being right on the margin. Um, but by setting that really ambitious goal, doing something that feels like it's not possible, I think you push people to achieve results that they would not otherwise have thought possible. Hmm. Now, I'm going to come back to Uber, obviously, uh, because that's certainly your main preoccupation and challenge now. But, uh, but I, I want to learn something more about your personal journey, about, uh, about, um, about the, the kinds of influences that shaped uh, your early life to a point, well, in fact, that contributed to shaping the person you are now. So what was the background that led to this? I mean, I, I, have, uh, I started in the UK, I'm, I'm British, um, and I'm very blessed to have uh, a mother who kind of uh, really believed that I could achieve um, great things and tried to push me um, as, much as, as much as she could um, with a teenage daughter uh, towards that. You know, she, um, my sister and I were the first to go to university full time um, within our family. Um, and my mum spent a lot of time researching, one, getting me a scholarship to a private school or helping me see what the opportunities were and, and actually achieving that. And then helping me understand like what a path to Oxford looked like. Um, you know, when I was a 15 year old, it wasn't actually front and centre for me, but she helped me see that that could be something that would be incredibly enriching in my life, helped me kind of understand how to navigate that got me set up with tutors and kind of explored this whole world that, that we weren't familiar with as a family, um, but she was um, thought that I would really benefit from. And, and I absolutely did, because it, it meant I met um, lifelong friends, but also really understood kind of the joy of spending time around smart, ambitious people with big ideas. Um, I then kind of found, like, post that, um, I've always gravitated to companies and, and new opportunities where I had the opportunity to to take a risk and try something. And I think that's one of the, the themes that goes through kind of my, my, my life, which is um, my first job was uh, not going to a management consulting or an investment bank, which is what a lot of my peers did at the time, but, but actually joining a new startup in the UK in financial services. Um, I've also, during my life, I have traveled quite a lot. I've left jobs and, and gone traveling and experienced things, always kind of with a view that um, you take a risk. You don't know when your next job will come. But actually, I think kind of new opportunities come by taking those scary moves. Um, I found that kind of with the move, um, leaving Amazon and coming to the Australia kind of has put me on a path here at Uber that um, I don't know I could have achieved in the UK. That move in itself was risky, but kind of really rewarded it, it for me. Um, and I think that's kind of one of the themes I, I look back on. I'm not sure kind of how much is whether that was just that I've got a very supportive family um, who um, are there for me to taking risks and and very supportive partner as well um, who uh, we spend a lot of time thinking what we want to do as a as a family as a whole um, as well as kind of individually and and support each other in the moves that we want to make um, or whether it's just internally I was always just um, a little bit rebellious and, and willing to try kind of make those moves I think it's probably a bit of a bit of all of them. <laughs> so the big commitments before here were, were Bain, the private equity company, and, and then Amazon. So what drew you to Bain and what did you 
What were the big things you learned from Bain? Yeah, um, I actually joined Bain in Australia. Um, we were, my husband and I had come to Australia as a lot of UK, uh, uh, people from the UK do when they're in their early 20s to travel around a bit and, and experience the world. My husband was working on the Commonwealth Games in Melbourne and I was kind of left thinking, what am I going to do while I'm here? Um, and so uh, at that point, I, I was interested in joining Bain. I actually joined the strategy consulting aspect, not the, not the private equity Bain capital piece. Um, and, and the reason I wanted to join was to get just a broader understanding of some of the challenges that companies face. Um, and it absolutely, absolutely did that for me. Um, worked with a number of different um, companies on some of the biggest challenges that they face, whether that is companies on the brink of, um, of bankruptcy needing kind of rapid cost reduction, um, working on 10-year retail strategies, really trying to think through what the future might be. Um, and I spent a chunk of time at Bain actually really researching organizational effectiveness and decision making, which I personally found fascinating. Um, and uh, I've taken a lot from that, which I've, I've put into good effect later in my career. Um, and then I, I found myself kind of when my children were two and four, um, I was ready to kind of go and do something a bit different. Um, I really wanted to own a part of a business and see whether I could actually lead that, come up with the ideas and deliver the results. And, um, and that was when I made the move to Amazon, which which also felt kind of scary. I had never worked in retail. Um, I joined the consumables part of that business, which was quite new around grocery and pets and kind of the, the everyday um, shopping items, which was a newer category to Amazon at the time. I didn't know much about retail. I had never um, been in that space before other than consulting into it. And so joining that company um, and with the, with the view that I could um, have impact and, and hopefully um, develop kind of a lot of the skills that I wanted for a future career um, mm. was, was kind of a scary move, but also um, definitely a, a good move for me. So what, uh, what was your big challenge at Amazon? I, I suppose it was getting to know that, as you say, but in, but, but in terms of actual moments, what was your biggest challenge? And, and, and let me ask also, tell me your biggest mistake. <laughs> Yeah, I, um, I actually think I made some mistakes very early on into joining Amazon. Um, I think you, know, I, I joined from a consultancy side, and so you do bring some of that uh, mindset, which is kind of trying to um, understand where the opportunities, be able to kind of uh, um, move things forward. Um, and I think early on in in the, my time at Amazon, I biased a bit much towards trying to have early impact and um, and thinking I had answers where actually I should have spent a lot more time listening and, and learning and, and building the relationships with people. Um, it was something that kind of I was lucky enough to work with uh, a manager um, who was extremely supportive to me, but also was um, able to give me very direct feedback about what I might not be doing well. And he took me to a side and said, you know, Susan, you need to just like you might be right, but that's not the most important thing. You need to make sure that you are building the relationships and taking people on that journey with you. Um, and I was very appreciative of that. I think one, it's it's one of the areas that um, you know look at the data, and females are much less likely to receive kind of direct feedback that they need in order to kind of improve than than male counterparts. Um, and I feel that's one of the areas I've been lucky to be able to have that, and I try to make sure I do that with teams that I work through. Um, and so it did teach me to kind of listen and learn, um, definitely kind of bring a humble approach to things, whilst also recognizing that sometimes you might need to push, and sometimes you might have the answer and kind of to, to kind of push through. And so I think that was one of the mistakes I made and, and kind of one of the opportunities. Um, and then kind of through that, I, I've just focused on the opportunities I had in Amazon to you know, really have impact and try to move the needle um, and try new things of which not everything will work, but some of it will. Um, and so I, I've got uh, kind of a number of examples of that. Um, I tried to kind of restructure one of the teams I was working to see if I could get more efficiency. Um, it really did not work. Um, and, you know, kind of I ended up going back to what we had before. And other times kind of, you know, we visited um, a number of the strategies that we had for, for some of the businesses and, and had fantastic results. And so you're not going to get it all right, um, but it's okay to kind of test, learn, pivot, and make sure that you just keep moving forward. So, uh, so in Amazon, you had a boss in Jeff Bezos who, uh, whose reputation who clearly was was a person of singular focus and a reputation for ruthlessness in the business. 
But in, in moving from there to Uber, you were moving to a company whose who's, uh, uh, chief executive and founder had, had imposed really from the top down, from everything I understand of my reading, a culture with a, with a reputation abroad of like the, the rampant cowboy in the old wild west uh, and, uh, and lots of question marks about the ethics of Uber and you're aware of those. You participated in that Four Corners program last year which went right through that. So how carefully did you do your homework on the ethical side before you, before you joined Uber and what was it that decided you that you could walk past those, those, th those rough edges of the ethics which is putting it kindly in one sense and, and coming on board? It's actually, it was actually a really simple decision for me because of the people that I met through the interview process. Um, when I was thinking about joining Uber, I spoke to people, a number of people within the Australia business as well as people in the US business. And to the person, I found passionate people who were at the company um, because they deeply believed in the mission, which was to try to improve the transportation in the cities in which they operated um, in. I think this was an industry, it was a new industry, um, unregulated um, as it was, a, it was something new and the teams had all spent a lot of time working to try to um, help governments kind of disrupt and, and innovate and we find now that kind of Uber is regulated in pretty much every market in which we operate in um, um, and so that to some extent disruption and new ideas come with, come with a degree of needing that resilience. Um, I would, um, and, and, and it takes a special type of team to do that. Um, in none of the conversations with any of the people were there any um, like flags to me and I, I continue to, to kind of believe that, um, you know, a lot of the questions on the ethics I think is an external in view as opposed to kind of what that looks like internally. And actually it's one of the leadership challenges about being in a company like Uber, which is kind of the way that it can be represented externally, other people's perspective of it is very different to how it feels internally. Um, it but, very but sorry, but I, I guess internally, yeah, you're not the target. You're actually implementing the program. You're not the target of the ruthless side of the program. And for quite a long time, for those early years particularly, uh, the, 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 a great part of the ethos was about you, you say it was unregulated. Well, it was unregulated for Uber because Uber hadn't existed, but, but the, there was quite a degree of regulation with regard to taxi companies and taxi service and so on. And, uh, and, and the story of Uber is a story of doing everything possible to avoid the regulators for quite a period. I, I don't think it's true that we avoided. We actually engaged with regulators extremely early in process in, in launching across, across, across the world globally in order to kind of make sure we got to, um, got to a good place there with regulators. Um, I think actually kind of the story of Uber is around listening to customers and finding a product that customers wanted, both um, people who wanted to use the service, who embraced this because it really improved people's lives. People were able to get a car, um, be able to have confidence they would be able to get where they wanted to be and be able to come back again. I mean, I remember g kind of growing up and you would go out um, when I was in my, my 20s and, and really not know how you'd get home. Like uh, getting a taxi was difficult. Um, there was a lot of uncertainty. I remember multiple nights walking home in heels and it was not a lot of fun. Um, and I think Uber dramatically changed that. Um, and that was one of the reasons why it grew so quickly because the product just worked. And not just from the customer side, the other side is the driver partners. Um, Uber could not have been successful were it not for the fact that this was a really um, a service and an opportunity to earn flexibly that the driver partners have embraced globally. Um, and so I think you kind of, um, you've got to remember there was a customer, two sides of the customers leading this. Um, and because the experience was so good, um, Uber then looks at that around, well, our opportunity and what we need to do then as a company is make sure it's regulated in order to keep giving customers this service they want, whether that is driver partners earning flexibly or riders having the certainty that they could move around the city in the way they wanted. I can accept that, it's, uh, that the culture may have moved on uh, from uh, under a different leadership, different global leadership. But but when you say that uh, that Uber worked with the regulators, just explain what that soft uh, that software package Greyball was about. That was about sabotaging the efforts of regulators to really glean and understand exactly what it, how Uber was operating, wasn't it? 
Look, it, it was before my time, and you know, I, I, I think kind of we're, d I don't know anything about that in detail. But like, what I know is that we have worked like um, with regulators um, in order to be regulated, and we have found that that is what's happened. Um, and in Australia, it was one of the first places to regulate. Um, actually, I think there's a lot of credit to Australian politicians in order to have been so forward-thinking. I think Canberra was the first city anywhere in the world to regulate ride-sharing before we arrived. Um, and I think that just kind of shows the way that kind of people think about this. And even now, when we look worldwide around kind of how governments embrace this, because they understood kind of what customers wanted, um, it, it's something that we kind of encourage other people to look to the Australia model. So, to, so come to leadership generally now, the nature of leadership. What, what is it that you have, what, what are the things that have impacted most on you uh, from other, other leaders, those, those leaders that you've identified that have inspired you, that have inf influenced the style of leadership that you s see yourself bringing to bear? I think where I have had my best experiences is when I've worked with leaders who have given me a confidence that I could achieve something that was bigger than I thought I could achieve and then supported me along that way by giving open, honest feedback, um, helping me refocus where I needed to, but, but supporting me along the way. And I, I honestly think that's one of the key roles of leaders, which is just know that the answers are not going to come from, from from you as, as a leader. Um, if actually you are answering all the questions, I think you're doing it wrong. Um, and your team, and particularly the people who are at the front line and the closest to the customers, are going to be coming up with the best ideas and will understand both where the challenges are and where the opportunities are that we can pursue. I personally think kind of what I try to do with my teams is to empower them in order to be able to achieve the results they, they want and to push them to be able to achieve results that they don't think is possible or that they think is a stretch beyond them. Um, but to make it safe in a way which is, if they don't quite get that, that's okay because we're going to have got further than we would have done if we did not stretch ourselves so much. And so I think part of it is creating that safety, that psychological safety to do the hard things, knowing that somebody has your back if it doesn't go quite well, and knowing that you have somebody that you can turn and um, to for help or advice or guidance and to be able to give that in a timely um, and honest way, um, which can be hard. People, um, people can find feedback hard at times, but I do think it is, um, it's extremely important to build that muscle, both of giving and receiving feedback at the right times. Um, and if you can do that as a leadership team and create that culture kind of across an organization, I think that is how you begin to get outsized results because everybody starts working on, um, on the most important things and feel that they're able to make a difference. So in four years, you've gone from launching Uber Eats in Queensland to Uber Eats nationally to the whole national ball game for Uber, uh, Australia and New Zealand, and then, and then to uh, North Asia as well, and now the pandemic has dropped in on top of all that, and all this in four years. Yes. So that, that suggests an enormous mobility and, and flexibility and capacity to adjust. I mean, when, you, when, you to, when, when suddenly North Asia is in your lap, as well as Australia and New Zealand, did that cause, uh, it must have caused you to, um, to take a big rethink because whole different cultures, I mean, there isn't an Asia culture, there's a China culture, a Japan culture, a Korea culture, and so on. So, so just tell, tell me how you address those challenges. Then we'll come to the pandemic. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's been a busy four years, but a lot of fun. Um, you know, I, when kind of I was offered the opportunity to take on North Asia, um, I think kind of one of the patterns that goes through my career also is um, uh, a, a huge degree of actually insecurity about my capability of doing things. I'm always kind of a little bit surprised when people kind of give me these opportunities and uh, my husband laughs at me a lot about kind of uh, the, the, my internal narrative and my capabilities versus kind of um, what he, he would encourage me to see as the reality. But I actually think that's one of my strengths, which is um, I never think I'm the smartest person in the room. I always um, question whether I have the right answers and how I'm going to approach a problem. And the way I tackle that then is by absolutely going into learning and listening and research mode. Um, so kind of, like you say, North Asia, um, incredibly different um, challenges to those that we experienced in Australia, both culturally as well as the business itself and what that looked like. Um, 
And so I always start those journeys by going on that listening and learning. Um, and I did that both by talking about experts um, of kind of uh, the cultural nuances of doing business in North Asia. I spent time um, with our um, head of diversity and inclusion, um, um, who is who is a Korean by, uh, by heritage and spent a lot of time with her trying to understand how I would need to adjust my style, style and what I would need to expect kind of by working with the teams in North Asia and how to get the best out of the teams that, that were there. Um, and I spent a lot of time listening and learning with the local teams in order to um, understand what the unique challenges were, what they'd tried, what was working well, what was not working well, and where some of their challenges were kind of with operating internally. Um, I think kind of one of the challenges you get when you get into leadership roles is, um, is making sure that the right information surfaces up. Um, I think kind of you find that the more senior you get, um, things get filtered. People will tell you the good news for sure. They, they will not tell you the bad news always. Um, and so I also at that early stages took some time to try and find who are the individuals within the team that would be my, um, my truth, um, truth tellers. They would tell me actually, how did it feel in the country? What were the teams feeling? What was kind of the cultural vibe at that point? Where were some of the challenges that might not otherwise be known? And also taking that time to make sure that the teams understood that um, I wanted to understand kind of the unvarnished things, what I was doing well, what was not going well. Um, because without having kind of all of that information, it's incredibly difficult to um, get to the right answers. And then once well, I let, let, let me just come in there. Uh, w when you want your people to tell you the un unvarnished truth about yourself, um, how, uh, <laughs> uh, how uh, happy are they to take you at your word on that? I think it takes a long, you have to build trust with individuals. And so there are people that I have worked with um, where I know they will absolutely tell, my, tell me the truth and I try and cultivate those relationships. Um, Jody, who is, uh, runs our Uber Eats business across the APAC region, um, one of those individuals who uh, will always tell me when I'm not getting it right and will also be my cheerleader when I need somebody to kind of like give me some of the courage um, that I might not internally feel like I have. And then with my team directly, I think you have to build trust and you have to earn it. But that means when somebody tells you something is not going well, think about how you respond to that. Because if the first time they tell you that, you are defensive and you don't listen, um, or you don't try and understand that, um, or in some way make it a difficult experience, they will never do that again. They, they will learn that and, and you will miss out on all of that opportunity. So I don't know that I always get it right, but it's always what I try and aspire to. So the, the pandemic. Uh, what has been the biggest impact on your business of the pandemic? And I know it's taken, it's taken uh, since uh, 2009 uh, for the company overall globally to, to get close to making a profit. And, and there was the forecast that you'd declare your first profit in the final quarter of this year. That's now next year. Um, so so what, has been, what has been the biggest hit that you've taken from the pandemic? It was interesting because obviously running North Asia, that is where we felt the effects of the pandemic first. Um, we were quite lucky from some extent, like being a global company, it meant that we could see what was happening in Hong Kong and Taiwan um, and South Korea, um, understand what the teams were going through and um, begin to get a sense of what this might do for the business. Um, actually kind of as a result of that being within my region, I actually, um, I actually raised this with Dara and the ELT and said, you know, we need to start planning for this to hit globally. And this was towards the end of February. Um, you know, I, I raised the flag that I think we needed more resources on it. We needed a dedicated tax task force. Um, and that is something that we set up um, at the end of February. In fact, I think we did it before the US um, had, had done that um, and to, as, a, as a country. And um, we were beginning to work on what those challenges were. And what we saw was, um, We've seen kind of, we're very lucky to have these two sides of our business. We have the delivery side of our business where we are delivering food. We're also delivering uh, retail goods kind of very early in the pandemic. We did a deal with Pet Barn in order to make sure that we could get pet food to people um, for their pets, like really important the, the, that um, those members of our family also got what they needed. Um, and that side of the business has, has seen extremely high growth. Um, uh, I would say that's accelerated our progress in that space by, by a couple of years. And then on the flip side, from a transportation perspective, um, you know, we, we saw businesses go down um, as, as low as kind of 80% um, year over year. Um, and then gradually what we're seeing is this similar pattern um, kind of around the world, which is 
when countries or when cities are going into periods of lockdown, then the transportation side and our rides business also naturally kind of reduces substantially. But then once it eases up, the demand comes back pretty fast. Um, we're seeing kind of across some of the countries which are um, where the pandemic is, is largely under control, particularly in some areas of Europe, um, New Zealand, when that was kind of opened up again, we see the business bounce back very fast. Um, but it is this kind of, we're going through waves. Um, I think in some countries we're now at the third wave of being in lockdown. Um, and I think that is what we're expecting from this point onwards. And so it's meant we've had to make some very tough decisions just around, well, with that the reality that we need to operate in, I think it's very important when you're in crisis to want, make sure you know where the opportunities are and, and figure out how to resource them. And so we made a lot of changes internally to make sure that the delivery side of the business was able to um, operate. We were able to support restaurants who desperately needed the service during this time um, and make sure the resources were there. And then on the transportation side, really figure out what were the key things we needed to work on, what absolutely could stop, and making sure we were set up um, with the right cost base to move forward, um, which has been very tough, very tough for the team. Um, but I think that puts us in a situation where um, we are set up for the next the next year, no matter, wi no matter what it brings. So um, I'm going to come to some questions now from, from our online audience. And I'm going to start with one from Stuart, uh, who asks, um, Uber was one of the original disruptor companies globally. Do you still consider Uber uh, to be a disruptor? And let me put a tag onto the end of that. Who, who do you identify as those companies or the company, those thinkers that are going to come along and be the disruptors of your business model? It's a great question, Stuart. Thanks. Um, I. I do still consider Uber a disruptor, and, and I say that because we're kind of launching businesses on a really like high frequency basis. Um, like, like I say, during during COVID, we have launched um, delivery services for retailers, which is beginning to get a lot of traction worldwide. Um, I think kind of in terms of keeping local businesses um, uh, growing during this period of time, being able to have access to really fast delivery um, is, is very important for them. And that is something we've launched over the last six months. Um, we recently bought Corner Shop, um, which is a grocery, uh, um, an, a, a kind of on-demand grocery delivery, um, and expect to continue to disrupt in that industry. Similarly, we've just launched a rental, pub, a rental product um, um, in Australia and, and in the UK and France. Um, we're beginning to kind of disrupt in that space. Um, and you know, we're continuing to test, learn, and understand what the opportunities are where Uber can continue to disrupt um, in the future. I actually think when I think about kind of where disruption is going to come from an Uber perspective, I mean, we, we operate in extremely competitive environments, which I think it means that most of the companies we compete with, um, whether that is in food delivery um, or in online retail or whether that's in the transportation space, it's just these are industries with a huge amount of innovation. Um, and I think kind of one of the big disruptors to Uber, uh, particularly on the transportation side, will be this move to mobility as a service. Like beginning to think about how can we move away from private car being the primary mode of transportation to finding ways for people to more cost effectively, but also in a more sustainable way, travel around that cities, whether that is access to micro mobility or um, autonomous vehicles and, and what they will bring to cities. Um, uh, moving to kind of um, electronic vehicles um, as well as thinking about ways to kind of unlock the car rental model, whether that is car sharing, car pooling, all of these options, um, I think is where kind of future disruption is. Uh, but I feel good about Uber being on the, the front foot for all of those areas. Yeah. So I've got another question here. I can only see part of it. So I'm going to ask the people operating <laughs> the laptop to, to show me the whole of Kirsty's question. Uh, so talking about the future, what are the plans for Uber Air? And uh, Kirsty notes that you will not now use Melbourne as a launch city. I think this is one of the areas that COVID has disrupted quite a lot, which is kind of um, air travel um, is, 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 is difficult and kind of some of the, uh, the investments we'd hoped um, would be made there um, uh, have changed. Uh, the model that we had hoped to launch was we, Uber was never building the vehicles ourselves. We were always looking to facilitate um, the network around which we could kind of operate these, um, including supporting kind of the, the vehicle manufacturers um, around what the 
right routes look like and how to optimize the network as a whole. Um, we found that kind of during the COVID um, situation, a number of these innovators within the, um, the EV toll vehicles um, have had to revisit their plans and, and that has knock on effect. But uh, I'm definitely a big believer in what this will be in the future, kind of 2025 plus. I think this is, um, this is going to be a reality. Um, and I do think that will change how people move, um, move around cities and particularly kind of being able to commute in and out of um, other cities from, from further afield. Um, but it's maybe a little bit away in the future. So uh, part of that future is the capacity, part, part of the pace at which that future becomes the present and we embrace it. It's going to be about the capacity of regulators to actually deal with the whole concept and the challenges of Australia. For instance, um, autonomous vehicles uh, or air taxis. There's got to be a whole framework of regulation around that. I mean, how is insurance going to work when there is an accident involving an autonomous vehicle or two autonomous vehicles who takes responsibility? Um, now, you know, I, I can remember even two or three years ago, people were coming up with some very ambitious um, forecast as to when these things were going to become uh, the reality and we still seem to be some way away. I think you're right. It's it's important to get the regulation, but also to to make sure there's consistency as well. Kind of thinking about this as part of a an ecosystem. So um, we, you know, part of what the role Uber is playing, both with the aerial um, vehicles as well as kind of in uh, autonomous, is you know working with the players within that industry as a whole in order to partner with regulators in terms of um, driving that regulation forward and being able to solve it. Um, I do think they are some of the most tricky parts of some of this technology and um, you know the technology itself is difficult but also just figuring out how we bring that to market um, it was one of the reasons we chose Australia as um, as a location for us to test um, the aerial uh, EV tolls because the regulators were so forward-thinking and um, able to have those discussions and I think we'll intend to kind of keep involving those in the conversations where, where we're involved as well so um, if you were to take a stab and we recognize that it's a stab and Share markets aren't going to move as a result of what you're <laughs> suggesting. <laughs> Best guess, when will we see autonomous vehicles generally on the roads in Australia? And, uh, and when would we expect to see air taxis, realistically? I think Ball front, ballpark. Yeah, I think realistically 2023 for testing aerial um, taxis. 2025 for them to be something that is like broadly available. I would say similar time frame uh, kind of would be my estimate around autonomous vehicles. But I, I just think there's a lot of uncertainty at kind of right how they're used, um, what the right what the right kind of mechanics of that is. Um, I think you know you can see autonomous vehicles being used in some circumstances. Uh, for instance, but very uh, limited. Yeah, very limited. Um, and there's there's definitely work to do still. But um, I would say kind of a few years time, I think we'll have a much clearer view. But um, I think it's within I think it's within this decade for, for sure. And I would hope by 2025. So uh, we have a question from Mark. What are you doing to develop leaders within Uber? Yeah, that, great question, Mark. Um, you know, I think one of the key things is try to empower people to be able to take hold of problems that they can solve themselves and give them the tools to be able to do that. Um, you know, part of what I think you learn as a leader is kind of you've, you've got to be willing to take decisions. Um, you've got to be willing to, and that means willing to make the wrong decision and be able to kind of um, learn from that and move forward with positivity. Um, you've also as a leader got to be able to inspire and kind of help people um, come along on the journey that you're on. Um, and so part of how we try and do that is to create kind of um, uh, program teams and, and innovation where people can get hold of an idea and really have the autonomy to be able to develop that um, and, um, and and execute within their country or, or even kind of take that responsibility from a global perspective. Uh, I know during the pandemic kind of the Australia team for instance were central for us kind of developing a product called Connect which, um, which now has been rolled out globally um, and part of that was yeah, finding some of our key talent within our team and, and saying, you know, please, please, can you go and try and figure this out? And, and um, that's how kind of you learn a lot of these skills. Um, I think what we need to try and do during, during COVID, I think one of the challenges is when resources are a bit more constrained, how do you keep creating those opportunities for people? Um, it becomes slightly trickier, but that is, that is how we think about it as a philosophy. Okay, now we have a question from somebody called Anonymous. And, and, and you've gone some way to answering parts of uh, this two-pronged question, but I'll ask it. So apart from COVID, what are your top three challenges 
and uh, top three tips for success in the business world today. Mm, very good. Um, top three challenges um, I'm facing at the moment or that we're facing. I think one, um, prioritization. I talked about this at the beginning. Knowing what you are going to do as well as what you're not going to do is very difficult. And when resources are lower than they were before um, and you're having to make that trade off, um, it is, it is often difficult. It's, it's far easier to find new ideas and to add that to a roadmap than it is to find something that we're going to stop doing. Um, people just, you get into routines, you get into habits. Um, I, I think that is kind of one of the key things I'm trying to wrestle with at the moment, which is how do we identify um, some work or some opportunities that we, we should stop and, and really stop and release resources to go and work on some other things. Um, and I think that is, that is a key challenge. Um, I think kind of the, the people aspect of the pandemic is, is really challenging as well. You know, I think we're six months down the line. Um, most of us are still working from home on Zoom. And whilst it is great in a lot of ways, um, you know, just I think we are, a lot of people are very much missing the day-to-day -day human nature of being with your teammates who, you know, you would have fun with, you could laugh with, you could kind of have a coffee with, and, and those kind of personal interactions, um, that is very difficult. It's difficult to create virtually, and I, I think that is, um, it begins to wear on the teams, and so um, I think trying to figure out what the right answers there um, is, is also a challenge. Um, I think the third. I think the third challenge is um, making sure, kind of, it's it's a bit linked to that, but making sure, given that that is the environment we're in, um, whilst we can continue to set ambitious goals, but also just recognizing um, people's resilience is a little bit lower than it would previous would have been previously, and beginning to balance kind of expectations so that. Um, environments don't feel too stressful, I think, is kind of an, another area that I think about quite a lot. Um, mm. I think, uh, sorry, the second part yeah, was... Very, very, very briefly on yeah. three tips for success in the business world today. Yeah. Concentrate on your day job and deliver results. Um, be somebody that people want to work with. Be reliable. Do what you said you would do and don't politic too much in the background. Um, uh, find something you're passionate about and you enjoy because you'll work harder. Okay. In terms of being somebody that people want to work with, this is one question of mine that I'm determined to get in. We've got two <laughs> or three more questions to ask from, from others. But, but I th it's important, and that is diversity um, and leadership, and even diversity in leadership. Uh, the report that's just been released that I'm sure you'd, uh, you'd have uh, heard about, that the number of female CEOs in Australia's top 200 uh, companies is actually falling, and that only one in 20 of the top 200 CEOs is female. What's your feeling? What is your reaction to that? And and how how do you turn that culture around? It must be, well, it's it is uh, a worry that it's actually going backwards. Yeah, it really is. And um, um, you know, there's a few things I think about here. Um, through the last kind of 10, 15 years of my career, um, I have been attending various women at forums and kind of like programs. Every company I've worked with has had that um, and uh, the numbers have not changed. Um, I, I kind of, part of what I talk about internally is I, I think this needs to be shifted from being something that women talk to women about. Um, the problem here is not women. Um, it is we don't need to change the tone of our voice or kind of change our style or, or any of these things. Um, I think part of the challenge is for it to, for kind of we need to make sure that the decisions that are taken that lead to differences in promotions and differences in opportunities, difference in hiring, um, and really kind of tackling some of the natural biases that people have is 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 kind of where the path needs to go. Um, I know internally, kind of the way we're thinking about this within Uber is for all of those important me like the metrics, like when we look at promotions, when we look at kind of what is the talent map and what roles do we have people in, um, when we look at kind of our recruiting processes, we do make sure that we have, um, we do look at our diversity, we make sure that we are calling out where there may be biases and trying to systematically kind of look at the numbers and, and tackle that. Um, I, I think it will, it does take kind of the men in leadership positions because kind of with those statistics you just talked about, Kerry, like the people making the decisions here 
are men and we need men to then make different decisions and really commit to this and understand that having diverse leadership will make better decisions, best, better customer experience, better organizations as a whole um, because you'll get more diversity of thought and actually it's good for business, not just kind of for society. Um, but it does take men making changes. Um, and so I think that is part of what needs to change is that the diversity conversation cannot happen with women to women. It has to happen with men to men talking about what they are going to do differently in order to achieve change. Uh, a question from Matt. What do you believe the role of government versus private sector is in innovation? What is the government's mm -hmm. role in innovation? And whilst governments talk about it a lot, what are the couple of key actions that the government could take to foster uh, innovation? And there's a reference to the EATS model. Yeah, that's, um, I, I think kind of, Part of this is um, just being able to be dynamic in responding to changes and innovation as they come. So, you know, I think governments can um, think about how do they make it uh, relatively easy for um, companies to be able to test and innovate and launch and explore new models, but then to kind of um, try to understand like what are the what are the risks that might need to be thought about from a customer perspective if there are any um, but be able to do that in a way that collaborates with kind of innovators so it doesn't become um, like a, a, a risky proposition to doing something new it becomes a bit of a partnership as you work through um, understanding kind of what works well what doesn't um, and I think if governments can stay focused on their customers the end customers the end consumers if there is a business and a product that customers are using you know I do think think government's roles in that is to make sure that kind of they they look at kind of what what people want and make sure that that is um, facilitated but you know they they do also make, need to make sure that um, kind of society as a whole is protected but I think doing that in conversation and openness with with companies is is one of the things that they can do we have a question from Madeline do you think uber will be able to make a contribution to I mean I would say does uber have a responsibility to contribute to sustainable transport in cities, even just a movement towards electric vehicle fleets? Um, absolutely, Madeline. Um, we, we actually made a commitment um, a couple of weeks ago, which is that we are going to be moving um, majority of our fleets to be 100% um, electric vehicles um, by the year 2030. And there's a number of things we're doing in this space. Um, Firstly, kind of micro mobility. So electric scooters, electric mopeds. Um, we have a partnership with Lime and with other um, providers of this, uh, of, of those modalities. Um, and we think that is gonna be a key part of helping movement around cities kind of be electric, be like fewer cars in the cities, um, I think is a, is a great move forward. Also this commitment to electric vehicles, kind of really trying to facilitate how we are going to move our, um, help our driver partners um, get into electric vehicles, but also working with kind of the facilitators of this. For instance, where are the battery charging networks need to be? How do you help a driver partner make sure that they can charge but not have to be offline and um, for extended period of time that impacts earnings? Uh, we have a team dedicated to that and working on it and have made commitments to also fund that financially. Um, I think we're one of the only companies worldwide that have kind of made the commitment to try and fund driver partners in order to be able to increase penetration of electric vehicles. Question from Ryan. Uh, you referenced slogans from the book Good to be Great by Jim Collins. Uh, what, are you, what are you reading these days to learn? I am deep in the founders mentality. I'm kind of, um, it, is, it is another um, Bain kind of book that's inspired by Bain Partners. Um, I'm reading The Founders Mentality, which is around um, one of the challenges uh, disruptors have is that kind of they disrupt, they get to scale, and then there's a couple of ways you can go. You can either kind of become an incumbent and kind of let complexity and scale slow you down, or you can become a, you know, a disruptive, um, disruptive scale um, company. It, it takes thought and it takes strategy. Um, and so that is what I am I'm reading. Um, and also, I just got a puppy last week, so I'm reading a lot about how to house train a small dog. So in, in the world according to Uber, as you see it, what is that world in 2030? Oh, that's a great question. I, I hope that Uber is the 
is a company and there is an app there that helps people improve how they get around their everyday life. Um, I want us to be supporting sustainability um, and giving people time back. So I think where Uber is there is helping small businesses, whether they are restaurants or retailers, be able to access customers and help customers access whatever they need in a fast and sustainable way. I think from a transportation perspective, I hope that we are bringing together a number of different transport aspects, whether that is um, tr public transit, um, intercity, as well as kind of intracity, um, electric vehicles or micromobility, um, or even just helping people understand the best walking route um, if they would need to go from X to Y. Um, so that for whatever journey you want to take, um, you can use Uber to do that. And for all your daily needs, um, you can use Uber to be able to kind of um, order and have that delivered. And, uh, and last question, so you're now living in the world of Zoom. When the pandemic is over, whenever that is, if it, you know, as a pandemic, as opposed to uh, whether the virus kills it off or whether we learn to live with it, but in that post-pandemic world, will you still be Zooming a lot more than you used to? Will you be traveling less than you used to? Do you see that as one of the permanent changes that are going to come out of the pandemic? I think there is going to be opportunities here for us to do more of that. Um, but I do think that the human nature of um, work being kind of one of the social aspects that we do, I think that I, I do anticipate that I will enjoy going back to an office and some travel, being able to see our teams, um, see our products on the ground. Um, I very much am missing that, um, though not missing being away from my family every week. Um, I actually think this is going to be a great accelerator to a new and improved way of working. You know, if I think about your question on diversity, kind of women being able to work flexibly around school hours, um, this push to 100% of us working remotely and flexibly, I mean, it has proven without doubt that companies can do it. And so that removes that as a question. It should make it easier for people to be able to get those flexible work. But, you know, as somebody who's quite extrovert, um, being back in an office and working with my team again is something that um, I'm very much looking forward to in the future. Um, but maybe I'm not going to go in five days a week. What a surprise that you see yourself as an extrovert, Susan. <laughs> Did that not Thank <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't <laughs> hide it very well. <laughs> Thanks very much for that's called self awareness. Yeah. Uh, so thanks very much for talking with us today, and on behalf of our host, the QUT Business Leaders Forum, uh, thanks also to everyone who's joined us uh, for today's discussion, which struck me as a very fruitful one. To find out when the next forum will take place, uh, please go to the QUT Business Leaders Forum website and sign up for the e newsletter. And I also uh, want to thank the SAE Institute here in Byron Bay for hosting my contribution to today's discussion. Thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of your day and until next time, cheers.